Yeah, we got a good we got a good group going on. Yep. Uh, well, let's see. Josh, do you want to start with the rates, how they're looking today and whatnot? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think uh did anyone get a chance to watch my extremely long weekend rates video? No. Nope. It was obnoxiously long and I apologize for the length, but uh I didn't know how to cut it down any further than what I did um without just going straight to slides. So the big thing with interest rates remains twofold inflation and the jobs reports, right? And this past week uh really shows the third um month in a row of the jobs numbers starting to come down as far as how many people were hired, how many jobs created, how many people were staying on unemployment longer, and a couple other you know really important key factors. And the reason why that's so important is that inflation started to come down, which that's great. That's a big component of rates dropping. But what also has to happen, and the reason why the Federal Reserve has been raising their rates for the past, what, 11 months now? I might be wrong on that, but it's like 11 or 12 months is to cool and slow down the economy. Um, so it's it's on purpose. They're not like it's a conspiracy theory that they're trying to slow down the economy. They have to try to get things under control. So all of the efforts and the work that the Fed has been doing to slow down the economy is really starting to take place. Um, I still think just, just seeing how many outlier items have been popping up from around the world, all the different international um um data that's coming in all the international economic data that's coming in i still think we're probably second quarter of 2024 before we start seeing a substantial decline in interest rates but i definitely think it's underway and i i, I think the one thing to caution people if you're running into clients about waiting until rates get lower and i just i, I see this as being such a horrible mistake to do is once rates go lower a point a point and a half even two points i truly do not believe it's going to cause more inventory to hit the the market i think it's going to be more buyers to hit the market and more competition and um if anyone's talking about waiting have them do the cost of waiting analysis i've sent out about 15 of those over the last two weeks. And uh, if you explain it right, they, they pack a lot of punch. They really do. Like it's, it is a legitimate situation where if they wait, they're costing themselves 50, 60, $70,000. You know, it depends on if it's six months or a year or whatever the case might be. Uh, much better idea to try to buy now, especially people think that, I don't know why people think this, but they think, and maybe you guys are thinking the same thing, that there's going to be this flood of inventory coming soon. Um, I've been hearing that pretty often. I just, I don't see how that's possible in San Diego County, maybe in other par pockets, but um, um, where somebody might be able to capitalize is that instead of inventory flooding, maybe buyers backing off a bit because rates are high, maybe people can get in on a house a little easier now than they could if they wait six months to a year for rates to come down. I think that's the bigger, the bigger play for anybody that'll listen. Josh, I have a quick question, really quick. Yes. It's Taylor. <laughs> oh, I, was trying, I was going through all the screens trying to figure out who was talking. You're like, who's that? Um, so for the cost of waiting analysis, what do you need for that again? Uh, it's real simple. I, I don't even need to talk to the client, you guys. If it's someone who doesn't want to talk to me, totally understand. It's not a problem. I just need a purchase price and a down payment and their loan type. Right. Okay. And I can work that up for you guys in a matter of minutes, print it out in a PDF and send it over to you. And then uh, let's jump on a phone so that if they don't want to talk to me about it. I can give you the tools and how to guide them through that document, because if you just send over a bunch of graphs, they're going to be like, I, 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 I. they're not going to know how to you know, decipher the information that's on the form. So uh, feel free. I'm happy to walk you guys through that. Awesome. Thank you. Of course. Um. That so rates, I think good good news is coming, but I don't even know if it's that good of news. I'll be honest. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how the how it goes. Um, 
The other one I wanted to bring up and I've gotten, I've received probably a dozen emails or text messages over the last week, two weeks, uh, was this, the, um, what's it called? The Dream for All program coming back in the fall, right? You can check the Cal Hafa website. And in fact, I'll just do it right now as we're talking. Cal Hafa is just C-A-L-H-F-A dot C-A dot gov, right? And if you go to calhafa.ca.gov, it talks about the Dream for All program. Where is it at? I saw it a week ago. Anyways, without wasting your guys' time, there's a lot of information about the Dream for All program on the Calhafa website. And they will update this website once they find out what the date is that's going to be coming out. Um, and any clients that are interested in it, they can sign up for their email blast. That'll give them more information about the Dream for All program. I just, I'm, I'm cautioning everybody and I'm not trying to be an anti-salesperson here. I just think it's it's the truth. Last time, we I think we pre-approved like 105 people for the Dream for All program. And we had one person out of everybody that got it. And the only reason why that person got it was because his offer was being accepted the day or the day after the program was rolling out, right? If someone waits for the program to roll out and become live and all of a sudden try to go get a house, an offer accepted, I mean, good luck. And last time with the money lasted, correct me if I'm wrong, it was seven business days. Am I saying that right? I think it was seven business days. And that's really before the general public knew a lot about it, right? And now that people see that the program actually worked and 2,000 people actually received the 20% down, how fast and furious do we think they're going to go this next time around? My bet is that it's gone in three or four days would be my bet. So if you have any clients who is saying, ah, the only way I'm buying is this dream for all program. I mean, I guess you got to take a shot, but I would definitely caution them on the, the reality of the program. If that makes sense. Josh, it's Wendy here. I've got a question. Hey, Linda. Do you know, I, do you happen to know if um, people who missed out last time because the funds were already committed, um, is there any sort of carry forward from those group of people that might still want to be in it or do they have to reapply? Great question. I don't think they've rolled that out yet. I think there's a lot of unknowns. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, all the people that applied and actually went through the education process, we had, I mean, we must have had 20, 30 people that paid the 80 bucks or 90 bucks to, to do the counseling that was required. Mm -hmm. um, and again, only one of them were able to get a house. So, so uh, to answer your question, I don't know the answer to that. I think we are okay. waiting for Cal Hafa to roll out more information. And once they roll out a date, I got to think it's just going to be a madhouse. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Again, not trying to hey, destroy Josh. Anybody, but just knowing the reality of the situation. That's all. Hey, Josh, was that money um, for the uh, registration or whatever it was, was that refunded back for those no. that didn't get it? No. So so that's the money they're using for this loan program? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they raised $200 million on counseling fees. <laughs> they figured out. <laughs> totally. Smart. Um, but other than that, rates are still a little on the high side. I think that people are going to be buying homes for the next couple of quarters with rates being on the higher side. I just think that's it. And I think uh, um, the biggest thing is just, taking the risk of buying a home and refinancing on the way down if and when that happens. And I'd be really, really careful in the verbiage when you guys are talking to clients, I'm sure I've already been told this to by the legal or whoever, don't promise anybody refinances. Use terms like, you know, if and when the rates come down, you know, you have the possibility of refinancing. So many people will say, they guaranteed I could refinance within 12 months or six months just to find themselves in a lawsuit later on down the road. So be really careful with that. <clears throat> that is all I got. Cool. Well, I kind of 
I wanted to share kind of to go back to what you were saying about inventory and kind of the historic on inventory. Um, so if you look at the chart since September of 2018, you look at the peak months where it goes like up and down the valleys, it's almost to, again, we're in August, September, you know, it's going to go up a little bit and then it's going to go back down for holidays, which is normal. As you can see, October, August, September, it goes start going down October all the way to March. Again, same thing all the way to March. Again, same thing all the way to March. March goes back up. September back down all the way. So I think you hit it right on the head, Josh. I don't think even if with rates, if the rates drop, I wouldn't see a slew of inventory, not with what the historic like the historic showing, because even when rates were low in 2021 and 2022, I mean, they weren't like it wasn't a crazy inventory. We saw, actually, we saw more inventory when the rates went higher right here, which is interesting. But we're seeing it to start to go back down, and then September, October is going to go back down. <clears throat> so kind of hit it on the head um, with inventory, and that's San Diego County in general. So if we did specific to, let's just say Carlsbad, for example. And this will be all the zips combined. It's the same thing. Inventory levels. Which is wild. Which means, and that's houses. So let's see, condos. More relatively flat, not as many peaks. Uh, can you go back further, George? Like, Can you go back like 2015? These trends are super interesting. Like anybody that thinks... <sighs> Like they could see this uptick of yeah. more things hitting the market, and they could interpret it as something that's not reality. And it just seems like the more, I mean, I, again, yeah. there's different types of people. I'm a graph nerd, I love yeah. graphs. So these kind of things speak to me. Right. Um, but so many people will take, they will take an uptick in um, inventory as, oh, this is, this is it. We're just waiting for the whole thing to crash out. This is the final one. Like right. with Bitcoin so many times. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, even, yeah, the the biggest peak we had an uptick in inventory is when the rates went higher, not when the rates went lower. And I wonder if that was because people thought they're trying to get out of there, you know, out oh, of there. Oh, they were freaking out. Yeah, they were trying to freak out. Yeah. Like they saw the peak, right? And they're like, I'm trying to sell before my house drops 100K. Yeah. So. Yeah. And now you can see September though, like September 22, 22 is kind of where it peaked off. Like, cause if you remember correctly, the house dropped, like started in like May to June all the way down. And then it kind of like veered off here before, you know, holidays, which is, and that's a typical slow, slower market, October, November, December is when it starts to slow down. As you can see in most all these. Let's do uh, and we go into Tycor title ourselves and just pull these Altos reports up. Yeah, so this is straight from the altos.re um okay. website and on the Hey Siri website, the login information is there. So okay. everybody on our team has access to this. Thank you. Yeah. I might be uh just repeating things you guys already know this next comment, but I thought uh I just came back from Lake Havasu for mm -hmm. Labor Day weekend. Um, and there was for sale signs all over in Lake Havasu. And I can, I was even talking to friends as we're driving around the town, like, oh yeah, the, the shift is coming. The markets, you know, where, you know, you're going to be able to get some great buys in San Diego in the next six months, nine months. And I think that just the reminder to clients that each market is going to be different. You can't take a Havasu, you can't take a Phoenix, you can't take, you know, some of these other places where they might be seeing upticks and then just, broad stroke that across the country each place is going to have its own particular um inventory issues and mm -hmm. uh, just a good reminder there's interesting and seeing it, that many for sale signs in one place and that's yeah. true josh and people need to keep in mind though because the majority of those homes are investment properties they're not yeah, they're, they're not they're not homes that people come in to purchase and they stay and they live in so they can't afford that stuff anymore so 
that's probably why we're seeing the influx there. And it's going to be probably more like you were saying, the opposite here, you know? Well, here's something to look at too, kind of to piggyback off the for sale signs that you guys are seeing. If you look in Carlsbad, houses listed at or medium sales sale price at one four, they're selling in 14 days. One eight to one nine, 30 days. I mean, that's still crazy quick for interest rates being where they're at. And you can see the higher, you know, even on the higher end, I mean, look at 2.3, still 42 days. Like that's super quick for that price point, which is unreal. So yeah, I don't see the crazy slew of buyers getting crazy deals, maybe in some markets. And I mean, Riverside County might be a little different when you go on the outskirts, but see i think something that i had noticed when the crash happened back in the day 2008 there was a trend of like we we seem to have followed like vegas phoenix i remember i think new mexico and florida florida like the all the sunbelt states they kind of got hit before we did slightly before we did and then it followed suit but that was that was something that was widespread with the whole you know mortgage industry and everything that was going on where i don't feel like we're running into that now so just like josh said it's it's more pockets of stuff yeah yeah was Let's, there people open there were there a lot of open houses held this weekend or not really was it slower because of labor day i had open houses over the weekend we had pretty good attendance um we did thursday night Friday night, um, mid midday, Saturday and Sunday. Didn't do anything yesterday because we knew that it was just the holiday. Um, but you know, we had a good twenty to twenty five people come through each time. Yeah. Hey George, can you search Menifee just to see what that market's looking like? Because I talked to an agent yesterday, and she was saying that supposedly that market's supposed to be smoking hot, and I'm like, uh, are you sure? <laughs> 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 let's see what's your price point on your listing uh we've got 585 okay so it looks like 530 is 14 days on market 625 is 21 so you're looking probably within the three week mark three to yeah. three week mark is probably what you're looking at because you're on the higher end um as you can see the uh average days on market has dropped since you know march of this year which is common uh let's see average list me median list price i mean it's gone up a little bit but it's kind of as you can see it's kind of like tapering off for median list price let's see inventory inventory is actually on the uptick so that could cause more average days on market as well. Okay. I don't know. I wouldn't say it's a, I don't know if I'd say it's a hot market. Um, still considered a seller's market, but. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Price decrease. They've, they've seen a 40% um, price decreases, which is pretty substantial. Yeah. Mm -mm -mm. Anyone else want to see any other areas? George, is, are there any areas that you've seen where they're getting close to a buyer's market? I'm going to guess not, but mm. like I feel like we're not going to see that for a long time. But is there any pockets or anything or, that you've ever even seen, like Hamul or somewhere like that? I don't know. No. Mm, maybe Hemet. Let's see. Can I've you been check seeing... Santa Ana when you get a chance. Yeah. So Hemet starting. I can check here. Oh, it's Hemet... getting there. Yeah. Yeah, and I've seen if I if I've seen correctly, people out in Hemet are the home prices are either dropping or they're getting more like seller credits, stuff like that. Obviously, you got to be okay with the area, but 
And what about saying yes and uh, I'm gonna butcher this spell of that. That's right. Ooh, I got lucky. Yep. See, it's even hot. It's still hotter than Hemet. So I would say probably Hemet might be a better shot. Yeah. Mm, you said Santa Ana. Let's see. Yours is a condo, right? Is that Felly that talked? I don't know who talked, but. Yeah, condo four fifty. Yeah, you should be fine. Did you have a lot of activity or no? I did actually, and it was a, a gated place that uh, people just finding ways to get in. So yeah, um, and apparently they weren't finding it online for some reason, but they were still coming in. Interesting. So, uh, yeah, or not. Well, it should have been on Zillow, I think. But um, yeah, your price point. If you look where you're at. It looks like 375 to 488. You're looking at, I mean, less than two to three weeks on the market. List price dropped. Price, yeah, but it's not substantial, like 16%, 2%. Let's go to. Quick question for anybody else out there too. What are you guys seeing in rents? How are the San Diego rental market doing? Is has that been climbing steadily? Has that been leveling off, going down? What are you hearing from your clients regarding rents that they're paying? Mm. For me, it's high. There's a house in Carlsbad across the street from mine, and it's a four bedroom, and they're trying to rent it out for like almost forty seven hundred a month. <laughs> <laughs> yeah ouch I, I just think that's still such a huge argument mm -hmm. in people's decision to buy they keep thinking well it will rent's fine right now you know i can afford rent right now but if rent keeps going up at three percent per year five percent mm -hmm. per year lock in that housing payment now with the option of it going down versus not locking in your housing payment and just struggling all the time because it's only going to go up. Yeah. And I think you, again, you have to believe it, right? As agents, you got to believe that this is the right choice or else it's going to go off to your clients that it's not. Yeah. So like, I just use my personal example, like I'm selling my house here in a couple of months and I'm going to be buying high with a high interest rate. So What are you going to list it at, George? Whew, uh, I don't know yet. It's tough because my neighborhood's interesting. Like some are moving quick and some are not. So, yeah. I'm thinking initially 949, but I don't know. I'm we'll hearing that, end uh, of October. What? that uh, rents are pretty much equivalent to what you would be making in a mortgage payment. The only difference is that you don't have to start putting aside money for your property taxes. Yeah. Yeah. Rents are just off the charts. Unbelievable. Anyone else seeing some interesting stuff happen with the buyers in this market right now? I've had two that after showing them houses for two, a month and a half, they went to renting. And there was getting beat out. <laughs> yeah. The response I got from my client was, um, I'm sorry to let you know, but we're, we're renting now, but you shouldn't be surprised with the San Diego market and the, uh, the interest rates. I was like, I don't know how to take that, but he was also unrealistic what he was looking at. That's Bella. Yeah. That's a big pill to swallow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think the danger is people getting priced out, right? Um, is anybody talking about the two one buy down? I'm, are you gosh, getting? Are you seeing anybody getting ready to use those again? Because, you know, I did a couple of them last year at the end of the year coming up. 
No, I, I don't think anyone's offering enough credit to make a two and buy down worth it unless they're offering over and then asking for that credit back. Mm -hmm. So no, I, I haven't seen one in I don't know, seven, eight months, probably. Hey, Taylor, <laughs> you hearing that? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> what? Loud and clear. <laughs> no, she has a client that's working with a specific lender that we can't really get them away from. But the oh, lender... Josh knows. Oh, okay. <laughs> The lender keeps telling them and has been telling them for about, what, seven months now that he's doing a lot of two one buy downs, one one buy downs, and that he doesn't understand why we can't do it. Huh? Yeah, I'm not. I was like, well, I don't know what he, what market he's in or what houses or what he's looking at because I haven't done one in probably over a year. Yeah. I feel like I'm starting to see some condos sit longer. Are you guys noticing that? I mean, the single uh, yeah. families, I feel like there's more movement with the single families and depending upon the price point, mm -hmm. um, if it's not in that four or $500,000 range with condos, but if it's at a higher price point condo, I feel like they're sitting a little bit longer. Um, and that could be a potential opportunity mm -hmm. for us to get our clients. in. I just, I've got one that she kind of pumped the brakes because of the rates. And that's what I'm talking to her about. I'm prepping her trying to get her open to a two, one buy down if we can find the right property. Yeah. I think kind of what Josh was saying though, the two, one buy down in a sense of getting them to do a, a right offer price to make it work for the seller too. Cause I'm seeing with some people they're coming in under list price and asking for a two, one buy down or even coming at at list price and doing a two, one buy down. And I'm sellers first, second week on the market. They're not going to do that unless they're desperate. But the, I wouldn't. The two one buy downs didn't hit last year until October, November. So who knows? Maybe, maybe it slows down a bit and that starts opening up again. All right, Josh, you got to help me with mine. I need a yeah. two one buy down. Let's go. <laughs> Josh, what, what triggers that for lenders to be able to back that up? So the two one buy down, there, there is an option where a buyer can take a higher rate and pay for the two one buy down themselves. There's only a couple lenders out there that'll do it. UWM, which is one of our major, major lenders, they're one of them, but when you crunch the numbers, it really doesn't make sense, right? So then that leaves it with the seller providing the credit to pay for the two one buy down. And there's a calculator that we all use. I'm sure you, most of you have requested you know, numbers on it, uh, especially at the end of last year, excuse me. Um, you know, if, if it's a six hundred thousand dollar home, it's a, or a six hundred thousand dollar loan amount, it's a seventeen thousand dollar cost to the seller just to get the two one buy down. So it's expensive. So it has to be a home that's been sitting long enough where they don't mind paying for that two one buy down because they're probably going to be dropping the cost or the 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 list price anyway. So is it better to drop the list price thirty thousand dollars or do a seventeen thousand dollar seller credit? to cover the two one buy down. And obviously the math says um, it's better to do the two one buy down. Yeah. And just to put it out there for newer agents, a listing agent's going to prefer that you um, either go over or uh, something because for them, they want to keep their metrics looking good. They want to get this price or higher. Yeah. So if you're trying to offer a lower purchase price. That might be a hard pill to swallow, but maybe you can get asking with the, I tell my clients an average of 20 grand. I go, we better just keep in mind, we'd have to get about a 20 grand, maybe less credit. Um, so you could either offer asking or go 10,000 over mm -hmm. and then ask for the $20,000 credit, 15, whatever it's going to take. But just keep in mind that the listing agent has motivation too, and they're going to steer their client to what's going to work best for them as well. Josh, on those two one buy downs, as a lender, do you prefer if the agents reach out to you and get the actual numbers or just ballpark it? Yeah, I think actual numbers and then add like 500 on there just okay. in case negotiations go up or lower or the borrower try, you know, changes their loan amount. Yeah. Um, it's a really quick calculation for us. So if you guys call over and say, hey, can you please give me the numbers on a 2-1 uh, buy down at a $600,000 loan amount, you know, with current interest rates, right? Mm -hmm. um, then... I can quickly go through, which I'm actually trying to pull up right now. 
Uh, I can quickly go through, do the calculations for it, send it over to you guys, and that's it. You can make, um, you can submit the offer requesting the correct amount. Yeah. Because if you request always, too little, it's always hard to go back and get yeah, more. No. You always want to go to your lender before you actually write the offer. So when I'm throwing a number out there, I'm just giving my client, you know, there's the potential for this. It could be a little bit less, could be a little bit more, whatever. But I would never write the offer without going to Josh or the lender first and getting the number from them. Just They just need the property address and obviously which client it is. And then they'll run those numbers so you know what to ask for the credit for. Yeah, more importantly, we need to know what you're going to offer. Mm-hmm. Because that's going to be a big part of how we you know, determine the loan amount. The loan amount and the interest rate determines the cost of the two and buy down. Gotcha. Cool. Any other questions at all? No, I think I'm good. George, you going to start using any variable pricing at all? You mean like the five ones? No, just the variable pricing on your um, listings. Because I've seen a couple of them recently and I haven't seen any in a long time. And I'm wondering what's variable things pricing? start to shift if we're going to see that. What's variable pricing? I don't even know if so I know. Like for instance, um, there's one in Shadow Ridge. It was listed for eight ninety nine between eight ninety nine and nine forty nine. So it's basically- Oh, you mean the ranges? The range. Yeah. I hate ranges. I, yeah. And the reason being- is because the ranges that I've dealt with as a buyer's agent, it's they're not realistic. It's they still so, want the top number, or they don't want that number at all. They want above that range. So it's because like I last year had a buyer that I went in literally right in the middle of the range, right, and they had no other offers. And the agent came back to me and said, "Oh, well, that's not the that's not the range that he wants." I said, "Then why did you put the range?" So it, it's false. It's it's false hope to the buyer, and it looks bad on us when we're saying, okay, they have no offers. It's sitting twenty one days. You go middle of the price range, and they're like, well, the seller doesn't want that. They want X. Mm -hmm. So I've never suggested my sellers to do ranges because it also puts them in a bad spot, right? Because if their bottom line is eight ninety nine, and you do eight ninety nine to nine fifty. That's also enticing if it sits longer than one or two weeks, somebody to come below that range, right? Or people think that the sellers will only entertain 899 to 950, but what if your seller's okay with 875? You're actually deterring buyers from coming in because they think that the range is the only thing that the seller's going to take. Uh, yeah. I see I see it as a negative, but that's I see people that do it and they like it, but I I see it as a deterrent rather than a positive. I'm just wondering if we're going to start to see more of that you to, may. Try, to try to yeah. entice those buyers, right? Like you, yeah. exactly what you were saying. A buyer's like, "Ooh, I can afford eight ninety nine. Yeah. So it might make them feel more apt to make an offer. And so more, more listing agents, if we start seeing this continued slowing in certain areas, right? Then it, it, I think that they might start using it just to try to get those buyers in the door. It could be. I always talk to, I mean, obviously it's all up to the seller, but I've always talked to my sellers. And I say, what is your bottom line, right? What is your bottom number that you want to go at? And usually we list at that or slightly below it to get up. And then that kind of, as long as you're within the market, you don't really get low ball offers. And if you do, then you just don't, I mean, you just throw them away. But like, I mean, if you get the super low cash offers, then that's normal. And I prep the seller ahead of time with that. Well, but, those, those Altos reports also showed that the majority of transactions are coming in above this price. So in this market, I I don't see the point of putting a range there because most people are going to be at the top of the market and then some. Yeah. Yeah, I think though, Cherie, you might see it. I, I, I think if I remember correctly, last year during this time, like October to middle of January. I think I did see more ranges come up though. Yeah. That's what I'm wondering is if we're going to see, um, I was talking with some of the ladies at the the Friday nights after dark, I was being my typical cheerleader. Ura, my husband was laughing at me getting everybody. I'm like, right offers, do it. <laughs> yeah, you know, let's, let's go guys. Let's rally. Let's... But yeah. um, I was talking about that and I was telling them, be watching, I, you know, if it's anything like last year, we're going to be able to negotiate below asking. We're going to get all our repairs. We're going to get credits. Um, 
uh, it just, we got to kind of keep our finger on the pulse guys and be ready because this is a time to be calling your clients, uh, depending upon what we see in the next couple of weeks, yeah. and get, getting them back in the game. The ones that have kind of been sitting on the fence. I just got another text this morning from somebody I'm re-engaging with and he was like, oh, it's okay. You know, rates are kind of high. So I'm going to nail them with data. And, you know, I, I just think that's what we're going to have to do. And my hope is that um, we can keep as a team opening some more escrows because we're educating our clients. Yeah. And leverage that, right? With people mm -hmm. saying, you know, all buyers are backing off all this say, well, my team just opened 15 escrows this week. So there are buyers still out there buying. And that's kind of what I've always done is show them. I mean, if people are visual people, show them the um, accepted offer channel on Slack. Just say, look, I mean, it's if you're transparent with them, you may get them off the fence. Obviously, it has to be the right client. Some clients are maybe not like that, but um, I think majority when they see it, you know, it could push them, a even nudge them just a little bit. So, yeah, but I think, um, Nathan, I think you were going to write a seller credit and then ended up not doing it on one of your escrows, right? So right now, like that one didn't work either, right? Yeah, but it was the first weekend on the market. So they were worried about appraisal issues. Yeah. So I don't know. I think unless you're going way over and asking for a seller credit back and the seller still nets the profit, then I don't see it happening right now. So I have a question. Um. So yeah. if I have a client... <laughs> If I have a client that qualifies for say eight fifty, but really wants to look at homes that are in the one point two, would that um a two one buy down would they be able to qualify for that if the seller is willing to do credits? I'm confused on your question. So you're saying somebody qualifies for eight fifty, but they're looking at houses one two. The only way they could do that is bring more cash to the table. So the loan amount would have to stay the same. Right? Oh, okay. Gosh. So that that wouldn't change, you know, if if the seller or do, does the two buy two one buy down, that wouldn't. Oh, I wouldn't. Make, no, because no. no, you have to even with the two one buy down, you have to qualify for the amount prior to the two one buy down. Oh, okay, got it. Okay. Yeah. Cool. I wish I wish that was the opposite, but yeah, I was just. It just it just thinking. saves them on their it just saves them on their rate. Yeah, um, I don't know how but it would it, be, it wouldn't right. automatically like give it more purchasing power, right? No, because you still go ahead, Josh. I'll let Josh. Do. <laughs> You're muted, I think, Josh. That's yeah, right. It, it might encourage them to buy more, to spend more, but if their debt to income ratio, let's say the ceiling is fifty percent, which is more for FHA and VA, but let's say it's fifty percent, if they're it goes by what the actual interest rate is. So if the actual interest rate is 7% and their DTI is at 49.9, well, then the 2-1 buy down will not allow them to buy more because it's they're still qualifying at the actual interest rate. Mm -hmm. Versus, let's say their DTI is at 35 and they're just super conservative. And now the 2-1 buy down encourages them to go out and you know spend more because their first couple of years the payments are lower they believe they're gonna be able to refinance later on to save the money well then yeah that could get them to buy more of a home does that answer your question okay yeah that makes sense yeah thank you of course i think the other sell point on the two one buy down if you're trying to get a buyer to understand it too is i, I like what josh has let us all know before is that basically that money, let's say it's $20,000, it goes into a pool. And it's basically the lender's way of being able to recoup the difference in the rate there. The, it's not the lender's not being hurt by doing the two one buy down, they're made whole by that money. But the beauty of it is if the rates do go down next spring or whatever, like, you know, we're kind of hoping, but we can't, we can't say for sure. Um, and they've already got this higher rate, they can refinance out of that, but that money is still theirs. They can use it towards the cost of their refinance. And then the rest of it can be applied towards principal. So it's still money in your buyer's pocket. And you can talk to them about that too, because everybody loves money, right? So it's just another way to 
kind of get them to understand the benefits of the two one. And, and they are getting locked into that 30 year conventional still, which is the other, the other benefit. So like Josh was saying, they're qualifying for their same loan. It's just the sellers paying up front to save them on their rate for those first two years. Yep. Are you all waiving um, appraisals on single family homes with your offers right now? I'll tell you the last three listings I had all had waived appraisals. Okay. That's what I figured. People play games with that though. Let's mm -hmm. face it. I mean, they're doing it, but they're not really, if it comes in low, they're going to do everything they can to get out of it or yeah. in most cases. So yeah. I take those with a grain of salt. Um, I don't know about you, George, but I mean, um, on it, one hand, it's nice, but I think it all depends, right? It depends on what's the down payment because if the down payment is 30 or 40, 50%, then the appraisal really doesn't matter anyway. Doesn't matter. Yeah. So waiving the appraisal is, I mean, kind of null. Um, if you have somebody that's waiving an appraisal of 5% down, I probably yeah. would question it because they can't cover the gap anyway, unless they have ungodly amounts of proof of funds and they're only putting 5% down for a different reason. Um, so it's, you got to go through all, each offer is going to be different, right? Um, and then the other piece, did they get an appraisal waiver versus just waiving the appraisal? So that's a whole different thing in itself. Um, but again, I, ha I mean, you guys tell, I haven't seen low appraisals coming in yet either though. Not really. Yeah. So true. Um, at least the buyer's agent isn't telling me they're coming in low if they're covering differences. They're just telling me we're good. So yeah <clears throat> hey josh have you had any appraisals come in low lately recently no it's, it's been a good i mean it's been a while since we've had consistent appraisals come in low yeah. i mean it, it, you might get the odd one every other month or so um but it's been it's been pretty rare for sure yeah and again, like Cherie said, though, there's ways around your appraisal. Like if you waive your appraisal, but your inspection's 10 days and you get your appraisal done in two days, well, you can either ask for it to come, you know, to cover the gap. You can get out of it. I mean, there's, you just can't use that appraisal contingency, but there's other ways to get out. I think if the home is like in really good condition, I've had two appraisals come in, um, Offers were 40 to 50 over asking, and they came in even higher than that. So wow. if it's a good home, it'll appraise high. I had one come in low on my 32nd Street down in San Diego, but I also think it was just the appraiser because he was appraising on a three-bedroom, not a four-bedroom. So then once I, you know, rebuttaled that, he brought it back up to list price. And then we went under contract two more times, and it appraised. 5,000 more two weeks later, and then 7,500 more three weeks later. So again, it's going to depend your appraiser. And as a buyer's agent, what I do want to say though, if you're worried, if you waive an appraisal and you're worried about it, contact the listing agent, make sure the listing agent's either going to the appraisal with comps. And if they're not, you need to go. You need to go with comps, meet the appraiser, give the appraiser your comps, even though they may not use it. Building that rapport with the appraiser may put you over the edge of like, if he's thinking, ah, you know, it's four grand low, but I liked her and they came out, they showed me their comps, they may appraise it at value. Yeah, that's, that's very that's true. true. Do I remove the very bottom one? Oh, Gary, Gary on Christian's check and all the other checks and put on your desk. Gary. You don't get all three. He's muted. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've had that. Uh, I always bring comps yeah. and, and I'm always nice and I'm always respectful. And if, if they want the comps, fine. But if not, that's okay too. It's just that, you know, this is how we made our judgment call on the price of the property. And they usually are appreciative. It's like, oh, it's like one or two things less I have to do for my homework. Yeah. So. Yeah, and the way I word it to him or her, whoever the appraiser is, I always tell them, I know every appraiser is different. I brought comps, take them, use them if you do. If not, then recycle them. Yeah, I was just going to share, George, um, 
Riverside County, my last three closings, well, one of those three closes today, but we did an appraisal gap commitment on all three, didn't have to use it on any of them. Um, the appraisals came in above what nice. we were under contract on. So, you know, I, I think sometimes we have to help walk clients through that and obviously making sure we pull comparable solds and share those with them, you know, mm -hmm. to help them overcome any angst in how we write the offer to help them compete. Um, but yeah, that's what I've seen up here in Riverside. Yeah. Cool. So yeah, appraisal waivers, appraisals waived and appraisal gaps are still very prevalent right now. It looks like. I will say though, as a listing agent, that would not put me over the edge to tell my seller, hey, take this offer because they're waiving the appraisal. Kind of like what Cherie says, um, it's an added feature, but if somebody else comes in with better terms, I'm probably going to push my seller to go the other way. Because ultimately, you as a listing agent, you know whether the house is going to appraise or not. I mean, you're running comps before, you know, you list the house, you kind of have, you keep up on the market, what's going to close, call the other houses that are pending in the area, see when they're closing, um, if they'll tell you. But I think the other terms that make, the other terms that make it better are, you know, rent backs or whatever your seller needs. Those are more I, I would say key factors to take in versus a, a waived appraisal. Cause like Sharice says, you can get around it, but getting a free 29 day rent back or getting other things or a buyer's uh, home warranty paid by your buyer's agent instead of the seller. I mean, those are, that's money in your seller's pocket versus a waived appraisal. Very good point. Thank yeah. you guys. But obviously, if you get a crazy counter back that says waive the appraisal, you probably should waive the appraisal if you feel comfortable doing it. Yeah. So, um, I think we have like seven more minutes. Anyone got anything else? Not that I can think of right now. <laughs> nope. Cool. Just keep in mind, guys, getting getting the offer accepted is half the battle. The other half is getting it to close, right? Mm -hmm. So just make sure whatever you're committing your clients to that they can follow through. Otherwise, you won't you won't get across the finish line. Yeah, and I kind of wanted to go through that with the inspections too, um, because I'm seeing more and more of the buyers are going aggressive on the offers and then trying to come back during inspections with quite a bit of money. Um, and I'll tell you, sellers are pretty standing firm right now that they're not doing it. Um, I mean, we've had a couple sellers that have agreed to it, but we prepped them ahead of time and they already knew about these problems. So it wasn't a shock or surprise. But if you're going in and you're saying we're going to take the property as is, if you're asking for anything, it better be safety and health related and it should be very minimal. Or you're going to piss off the seller and they're going to go back to a backup offer. So yeah, Shuri, I think you're dead on with, you know, committing to what you put in the offer um, to get them to the finish line. Cause then not only you're going to waste your time, you're wasting the buyer's time too. <laughs> yeah. And our TCs, right. All that work of opening well, yeah, escrows everyone. and, and everything and then cancel. And so yeah, sellers are um, kind of digging their heels in. They're not so desperate just yet. Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Um, you know, they're not going to go crazy with repairs. So just make sure that you guys talk to your clients about that. Yeah. Up front. Cool. Yep. I think. And so are we seeing a lot of canceled escrows right now? Are you guys seeing your buyers cancel more? I know Jody just had one on that Fallbrook one, but luckily she had showed them a bunch of houses. And so mm -hmm. they got right back in on another one, but um yeah there were more things going on with the house than you could see with your naked eye. So when they okay. got the inspection report, the buyers were just like, Whoa. Mm -hmm. And then of course they wanted repairs and the sellers like, eh, nah, yeah. it wasn't an as is situation um, either, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, but she got them right back in escrow. So good for her. 
Yeah. All right. Yeah, I think, you know, just keeping our buyers, it, obviously not, if you see things wrong with the house while you're showing the house, point it out. That's what I do. And most of the times when you're honest and open with your buyers during walking through the house, they're going to be less shocked when they get that inspection report. So like biggest piece I always do with my buyers, I walk it through, I look for termite damage straight up. Like you can see it. And just tell them like there's wood rot right there. So it's going to most likely it's going to come up in the report. Um, if you see, I don't know, missing caulking or whatever, like the small items that you know you're not going to ask for, tell them. And then obviously say if there's anything that comes up bigger during the inspection, those are the things we ask for. You know, if they do a full inspection on the hot water tank and it's like dead, then do that. But I don't ask yes. for miscellaneous small stuff i always tell them that's handyman repairs like don't do it part of home ownership yeah i think the other thing you guys if you're having to deal with what i just dealt with with my stubborn buyer mm -hmm. um, that when you're trying to attest to the value of working with a buyer's agent and having your own agent it's not listing agent's not going to point out all those things with the property that he knows or she knows that are wrong with it no. Buyer's agent will. And, yeah. um, that, you know, there's again, just another way of speaking to our value when we're trying to secure that buyer and keep them from jumping over to a listing agent to think they're going to save money. You're like, trust me, between the negotiating both on price and repairs, I'm going to more than compensate the nine or $10,000 that that agent's going to give you. Right. I mean, I just went through that. He called me back. I texted him. I'm like, so, and he called me and he explained, yeah, he wrote with the listing agent and he told me I was fantastic, blah, 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 blah. And then literally said to me, I just wanted to work with the dual agent. Yeah. Mm. I don't think he gets it. Cause he literally said to me too, he goes, yeah, we're going to be closing escrow in a couple of days. I'm like, no guy it's called opening escrow. So, I mean, he's just so far <laughs> off the, yeah. To him though. yeah, he's lost. If this falls through and he comes back to me, I'm not working for him without a buyer broker agreement, period. So, so did he, did he write on one of the properties you showed? I not the, no, not the ones that I showed recently. And I showed him a couple of properties when I first met him, got him to Josh, worked on pre-approval, but we had to wait a few months for his wife to have her permanent employment. Um, and then sure enough, like we were looking at homes and I showed him a couple of places. And then I get the call of the previous weekend that he had written an offer with a listing agent. And, uh, you know, that's, that's when he told me, he goes, I want, I want to keep my options open. And so I knew I'm like, okay, he's been poached and this is the way it's going to go. And then the place was still active. He's like, she told me they took another offer and not mine, but it's still active. So I called her and didn't tell her who I was representing and just felt it out. And she told me that that was the seller's choice because it was a cash offer less than my client's offer that she had written. Mm. And she flat out told me, she's like, I could have double ended it. She didn't know it was my client. She's like, but the seller wanted cash. And then that one fell through. And then he went back to her and she wrote it for him again. And they went, I saw it was in contract. So I texted him and he called me. Yeah. So. Happens. Well, Happens. Yeah. Good thing. I mean, you don't want to deter some of the agents, but like at the same time, this isn't as common. I think you're going to get more buyers that work with you versus yes. more, more than are going Absolutely. to get agent. Yeah. Yeah. So. Now this guy was just all about dollars and cents and he wanted yeah. cash out of people. Yeah. Um, you know, if I offered to give him I, you know, money, which I can't, couldn't do, right. It's, it, it was Zillow and everything else. I can't be throwing him right. several thousand dollars in commission. Like this, oh, when this lady's a broker. I'll tell you one story before we get off here because we have one minute. But like one of my Zillows from, it took me a year. I just stayed in front of them, never showed them houses, knew they had a buyer broker agreement with another agent, right? I showed them one house or I showed them five houses the first time I met them. A year later, they messaged me two weeks prior to when their buyer broker ended. And they said, hey, in two weeks, we want to come see houses with you. We're over our agent, blah, 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 blah. They did the same thing. They went with an agent that was giving them 10K, came back. I put them under contract one week into showing them houses after that buyer broker ended and we closed. 
Um, and did and you I, have I, them sign a buyer broker with you or not? You didn't, right? Because you probably no. felt pretty confident at that point. Yeah. Well, and I told them, I said, guys, I'm not giving you anything. Period. I said, you went that route with other agents. It didn't work out for you. I said, but what I can tell you is you're going to get a great house. You're going to work with a great lender. We're going to give you the best rates and you're going to close and be in the house. And we did. So, and I'm not opposed to giving some, you know, commission back to clients, especially with Zillow, because they take their cut after, but it can't be 10 K it's if you're going to give them a thousand or 1500 or 2000, whatever, then that's fine. Depending on the price point, because Zillow then takes their cut after that. And Zillow is the only referral partner that does that. So, but no, I would not be giving 10,000. But I think we're over. So let's hop off. That was a good one. Josh, see you later, dude. Thank you, guys. See you, guys. Have a phenomenal day. Thank you.